Uh -oh. And welcome to the SA International Telephone Webcast, Vehicle Powertrain Calibration Engineering. What is it and why is it for you? I'm Sam Meinhart, Manager eLearning for SAE International's Professional Development and your host and moderator for the next 60 minutes. This e-learning event today features our speakers, William Sheeran, Calibration Supervisor, Ford Motor Company. Hello there, Bill. Hi, Sam. Also with us is Julian Blair, Calibration Process Lead, Engine Development, Calibration and Verification, General Motors. Hello, Julian. Hi. Also, Tallis Park, Skill Team Leader, Calibration and Certification, AVL Powertrain Engineering Incorporated. Hello, Tallis. Gentlemen, I'll be turning things over to you in just a moment. I thought I would quickly go over the objectives of our program today, and they are to explore what is a calibration, role of calibrations in an engine, powertrain, or vehicle system, tools and testing environments that calibration engineers use, integration effort when calibrating subsystems, some of the challenges facing various industries that require calibration expertise, and finally, why there's a need for more calibration engineers and how you, those participating, can get involved. Just a quick mention that this program is protected under U.S. copyright. No portion of the event may be taped, stored, or reproduced in any form. SAE is recording this event, including your questions and comments. We'll be making the recording available on our website. I'll provide more detail on the recording towards the end of the program. And speaking of questions and comments, you will be provided a formal opportunity to talk with our speakers after all three have completed their presentations. So when we get to that point in our program, I'll provide you with instructions on how to get into queue to ask questions. Well, because our time together is limited to an hour, I'd like to jump right into our first presenter uh, presentation, Bill Sheeran. Bill is Calibration Supervisor for Multiple DI and GTDI Engine Applications at Ford Motor Company. He has over 23 years of experience with the powertrain organization in both advanced research and forward model development and release. In the advanced research area, he worked on developing DI and injector systems, the first PZEV I-4 and V-6 emission system at Ford, and alternate fuel technology development. The forward model development included the development and release of several powertrain lines. And his most recent project was the global release on the 2.0 liter GD engine in the Focus with a new control system produced in seven plants worldwide. And with Bill, we'll go ahead and pass things over to you and get started. Thanks. Um, Saying a little bit about uh, what is calibration and roles in the powertrain development, um, what is that? Then on to uh, Julian, who will talk about the calibration in the vehicle, um, talk about some challenges in the industry, and then we'll give Sam as how, uh, how do you get involved, and finally, some questions. So, what is calibration? I mean, you've heard of what calibration is, but don't really know much about it. I guess at a level, calibration is the tuning of the powertrain control system parameters. The bill often competing attributes and requirements. So it's the of the product that meets all the functional requirements. The calibration was balanced several attributes from multiple different sources. That include things from the crew demands. I mean, these are the uh, our end customers, the the people finally drive the cars. These are the things that they uh, they want out of the vehicles. Government relations. These are things that are legally required in a given market that uh, that they require you to sell, um, so such as emission requirements, fuel economy requirements. Things to try to make your brand uh, differentiate itself from other brands in that segment or in that market. How do you make yours unique with a, to a, to the market and a given product? The corporate needs. These are that the, the corporation needs to um, how it fits into its brand portfolio about uh, mission requirements and, and cascades and fuel economy regulations um, will fit into their their corporate needs. And the calibration is tested multiple different environmental conditions. 
So everything from extreme cold weather uh, to the heat in the desert, uh, sea level to some high altitude, depending on the market. It's, and then to make sure that the calibration is, is robust enough to get back to um, the customer actually wants and demands out of the vehicle. So we, with all the balance, all these different attributes and requirements from all these different multiple sources, the calibration truly requires a total system level approach, a very system level job. Uh, a splitter chart that kind of portrays the different attributes and, and, and the balance that you're trying to go through. And you can see it contains multiple different um, areas from customer acceptance to drivability, uh, cold and drives, automatic shift quality, as long well as the government regulations of what do you need for emissions and fuel economy, uh, diagnostics, uh, corrections of how you handle the interfaces with other components within your system. Them. So the goal is these are a variety of different attributes you need to balance as you go through and develop the calibration. And to do this, it needs to be a system level task. So what's the calibration engineer's role? Well, but the calibration engineer needs to have multiple skill sets to have all these different requirements from all the different attribute teams. They have very diverse training and background in these these different skill sets. Engineers need their multiple features to really develop and optimize their systems. These include base and transmission on the ending, very technologies for base uh, combustion engines along with hybrid systems, vector systems, and how the control system Interacts, how the algorithm is written and how it interacts with the hardware. Actuators, um, how they interact with the system and how they respond to the inputs. The architecture, how the computer communicates with each other. Um, the systems, and then obviously the regulations that there are corporate or government regulations so we can finally sell the vehicle in, the, in a given market. The difference we have is that no one person really comes with all these skills to be a calibrator or has the same level of experience. They really come from working with the systems and their actions over time. Really a, a, a course that's taught universities that 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 be a calibrator. Basically what you get out of the universities is, is the understandings of the system and is learn. You get sets to be a calibrator by working in the field and over time. So this course and some of the other courses they will talk about um, are just to accelerate this development process. <laughs> Companies perform uh, many different tasks as they go through their development process. Multiple disciplines can be used when for engineering. Uh, there are multiple different degrees that engineers have, mechanical, electrical, chemical, computer science. Um, since there are many areas and tasks that need to be completed, there's a variety of degrees that can be used and applied um, as for developing a calibration. Calibration forms many different tasks as they go through. Um, oh, sorry. Um, since we are full-level system engineering, uh, understanding all the different systems is a, is a key part of being a calibration engineer. Um, some of these systems do the engine and transmit functions. The electric interfaces, since, since my system is controlled by the sensor and actuators, really these work as a good skill for a calibration engineer. The tasks are understanding Start algorithm design. Um, really know how the algorithm is designed to run on, on the components you have, and seeing it actually works in, in an actual design. Um, and those differences, uh, great skill sets. So being able to read the code and understand how it flows works very well. 
chemical reactions in the exhaust system. Um, one of the deliverables for a calibration engineer is the emission requirements. Um, these uh, these routes are uh, are regulated, and knowing how the catalyst system um, and the catalysts themselves function, uh, chemical reaction basis is a good piece uh, set to have by a calibration engineer. A formal and informal training that engineers have. Those are skills that, that are really good to have. Um, Community skills and working well with teams. Um, since it's a system level job, being work well with and communicate with other teams is a great skill set. Be a self starter. Need to really uh, have on involvement in driving. A good portion of the uh, calibration engineer's time is spent in the vehicle um, doing and developing the calibration. And so um, that is a, is a big plus. And having good computer skills, um, some of the basic uh, off the shelf Excel, MATLAB type tools, the industry tools of ETOF, ATI, and other um, communication cool tools that are used specifically by calibrators. They, they collect a lot of data very quickly, and having this good computer skill set helps you analyze that data fast and get to the results quicker. Engineers, as a system engineer, talk a little bit about you know what really you know what is the system that we talk about. Um, and the system can really depend on you know what to complete, and you know so a component can be a system or a subsystem. So if the highest thing the, the is the vehicle system, then subsystems would be the powertrain, the chassis, the electrical system, body, etc. You get the powertrain is the system. In that case, you have subsystems of the fuel, your turbochargers, your purge system, the exhaust. So there are many ways to define what your system is, and it depends on the task you would have as, as the engineer. Here, we'll also interact with multiple teams as they go through the process, depending on the system they're going to develop. These are the store controls team. These guys that write the array and the coding that uh, you'll be uh, in the systems. Technical teams that define the modules and, and how the module operates. Chat teams that have traction and control stability inputs to your system. Um, base hardware, how does the base engine or transmission function? The teams um, that put other constraints on you as far as uh, what are vibration and noise requirements would be for the final customer. For teams that are responsible for the vehicle dynamics and performance, um, and the regulatory requirements of what you really need to pass to be able to sell the vehicle. Um, so the, the overall this is the calibration needs multiple attributes from activities. Calibration engineers, you know, as a system level engineer, it takes the balance these things to deliver the final calibration to the customer. We'll uh, move on. Okay. Thanks, Bill. And uh, if anyone has any questions for Bill, please hang on to them after our other two presentations. We'll be opening up the phone lines for your questions. But for now, we'll continue with the presentation with our friend Julian Blair. Julian is calibration process lead engine development, calibration and verification for General Motors. In this position in January of this year, Julian leads the Global Calibration Process Technical Resource Board with the charter of streamlining GM calibration tools to enable the benefits of common process. Previously, Julian was a calibration specialist on V6 passenger car applications for a number of engine calibration areas. He also held positions of lead engine calibrator test option engineer, and test technology engineer in the GM engine development dynamometer laboratory. Julian, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sam, for that introdu introduction. So we uh, talked about what is calibration and calibration's role in the development process. I want and talk a little bit about the, the Calibration in the vehicle. What calibration does in the vehicle, primary, 
property is, is to satisfy uh, three customers. And when you look at this graphic here, it shows a Venn diagram of <clears throat> those three customers. First one is the consumer, the second being that of the regulator, third being that of the service technician. Each important importance is put on each one of these different uh, customer bases that the calibrator has to attend to. From consumer perspective, the, the calibrator is more concerned with the comfort uh, that he is providing to that, that consumer, the performance that, that he's going to deliver to that consumer, and the vibration and harshness um, associated with the what he's going to do that that consumer will see. From a regulator's perspective, it can have to satisfy all of the emission requirements uh, set aside by the regulations. And in the service area, the calibration engineer is concerned with how serviceable his work is once it gets into the service environment. And those are the primary functions that the calibrator is concerned with, with to each one of those commas in this diagram. But there's some overlapping areas um, that highlights what the calibrator needs to do to satisfy the cross-functional needs of, of these different customer bases. Um, the first one is the noise. Uh, some customers are concerned about noise. Uh, they, they don't want to hear loud noises or squeaking noises or rattles in vehicles, and so the calibration engineer works to address those. But at the same time, um, there are some regulations that govern noise requirements, and so a power train calibration engineer will also be concerned with that. And then from a service technician's perspective, the, the calibration engineer, if a customer brings in a vehicle that has noise, uh, the calibration engineer needs to be able to Put together procedures so that the technician is able to to solve those noise issues, and the same with durability. Calibration engineer, you would need to make sure that the durability satisfy the three more bases that we talk about here, and the thing for drivability. Uh, the calibrator has to ensure that the product is drivable for the consumer. The Unintended drivability uh, aspects of it from a relation perspective, and um, also to satisfy service industry. If a customer has a problem uh, from a drivability perspective, the calibrator needs to be able to have a means to resolve that 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 issue. Um, from the fuel economy side, that the calibrator has to deal with. He is satisfying that of the consumer and the regulators. And so that's another aspect that, that is high on the priority of the calibrator to ensure that the fuel economy and the safety requirements of, of both the customer and the regulators are met. From the regulator's perspective and the service technician, diagnostics is the key components that the calibrator has to ensure uh, the requirements of, of both the regulator and the service technician so that they properly diagnose any regulatory issues or any issues that the service technician may need to address to bring the car back to or the vehicle back to proper functionality. And finally, uh, dependability. The, the, the dependability aspect of it, it keeps the consumer from making visits to the service technician. So the calibrator has to ensure that, that when he, the calibrations are, are done, they're done in such a way that they are robust and dependable to ensure that the consumer doesn't pay the visits to, to the dealership or to the service uh, technicians. So how does he do that? Um, when you look at the vehicle system architecture, um, this is the bare bones of a, of a chassis system, you have um, 
control modules that are fundamental to the to the development process within the vehicle. And one of those is a fuel system. Another is an engine control module and the transmission control module. These are the, the primary modules that are the minimum requirement to, to provide train calculations. In addition, uh, there are hybrid modules that are used in hybrid applications that drive more complexity. And there are chassis and body control controllers that, that also have calibrations associated with them. And all the calibrations are connected across a controller area network bus that provides the interconnectivity um, for the calibration to do his, calibrator to do his work. So what components of the subcomponents that the calibration engineer needs needs to work on and to make them robust and meet the customer needs, uh, both of the consumer, the regulator, and the service technician. So from a powertrain perspective, um, the engines to be calibrated are pretty much the propulsion systems, which are engine trans, hybrid fuel cells, and any other mechanisms that provide propulsion to the vehicle. Or And you have the fuel delivery system and the emissions uh, system. So from a powertrain perspective, these are the primary elements that, that you look at for, for a calibrated engineer. On the chassis side, um, there are think components, the contraction control components, suspension stability control components. And these two work hand in hand with the powertrain calibrations. And then the electrical side of it, the communications within the vehicle, the charging system and the charging systems. And then the main L that is uh, referred to when creation of power modules is each fact system because all of the heating, ventilation, and cooling primarily is driven from the powertrain calibration system. And so as a system, the calibrator is responsible for handling the specific tasks and the interactions between all of these modules. So each one of these uh, subsystems have an even further breakdown where you go into the component level of which the calibration engineer needs to be able to, to operate and, and do his work. On the engine side, there are a whole host of different components that, that need calibration. The air delivery system, the throttle body system, cases or spark ignition systems, response systems, weight systems on, on turbochargers, and, and you have a whole host of flow sensors, pressure sensors, and temperature sensors that, that need to be calibrated during the process. On the fuel system side, you have the fuel pressure and the emission side of it. For transmission, you have torque converter, you have gear management, you have pressure sensors, you have temperature sensors, and a whole host of elements to, to be calibrated in there. On the hybrid side, you have motor charging systems and, and torque control algorithms that, that need to be calibrated. And then for the regulations, you have the exhaust and emissions part of it, which includes the catalytic converter and the pressures and temperature drops and some filtering and regeneration of, of the, the systems. And then from the vehicle side of it, you have the vehicle com components that impact the calibration um, space from a powertrain perspective. And they include cooling fans, boost pumps, um, and thermal management system, HVAC system, so on. And finally, is the diagnostic area of the calibration, where you have each sensor that you have uh, has to have some type of diagnostics based on federal requirements or the requirements of the regula regulatory industries. So the goal of the calibration is to manage all of these interactions while 
pay special attention on, on the task at hand. And, and this graphic helps the insight that, hey, these guys have to go across the tightrope. They have to also manage the interactions between each other and make sure they, they make it successfully through the process. Really, the, the goal of a calibration engineer is in sync with the uh, first canon of an engineer, the fundamental canon of an engineer, which really states that the engineer shall hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of, of the public. And so when the activities of a calibration engineer, those have to be kept in mind. And so where does a calibration engineer go to, to do the tasks? He goes hot weather, cold weather, sea level, altitude, heavy grades, meaning up and down hills and valleys, <clears throat> and even to national locations. This graphic shows some uh, uh, a four corner end on where the calibration engineer goes. So high altitude, cold temperatures, low altitude, hot temperatures, um, dry and hot weather, and then very cold, icy conditions. The so track systems which manufacturers use for the calibration engineer to actually do his, his or her work. And these services have come in a variety of styles and fashions for the calibrator to be able to do the different tests that he has, he has to do, whether it be high-speed testing or straightaway testing or, or handling testing. Um, there are a whole number of uh, facilities which the calibration engineer would use to, to get his or her work done. And just some examples of, of, of test tracks. This one is the Milford Proving Ground that in Milford, Michigan. Um, there are others here world test track facilities and websites are here for you to refer to so that you can go and get more details. But you can see the variety and the differences with the test tracks. And is, is owned by a different OEM that has specific requirements and, and designs for, for the test track. This test track is a one forward Arizona proving ground where they do hot weather testing on an oval track. They do shed testing, refer type testing, and engine management uh, type testing. Uh, we also go on road surfaces, so in the Denver area, uh, high altitude work, anywhere from 5,000 to 14,000 feet. And so definitely go into the field and do field uh, testing. And then this is an example of uh, Manitoba. Um, in Manitoba, where there's a cold weather facility where the cold weather testing is done. And the expectation is to see temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees for cars and drivability issues. And there are also labs that the calibration engineer would, would work in. This one is an engine test lab. This is an in-vehicle dynamics test lab. Third is an emissions test lab. And, uh, this one is an environmental chamber where, where the calibration engineer can make snow in the test lab uh, that based on the testing that he or she will be doing. And then this is a cutaway of... Uh, the details of one of those test labs, and it shows all of the intricate details of how much mechanical uh, material is needed to actually get this into a environmental chamber such that it can be tested. So I'll back over to Sam. Thanks, Julian. And again, we'll be allowing for questions at the end of our final presentation, and that will be presented to you by uh, Talis Park. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges faced by industry. Uh, Talis is the calibration skill team leader at AVL Powertrain Engineering based in Plymouth, Michigan. He's responsible for diesel and gasoline engine calibration, transmission calibration, as well as certification services throughout North America. His team's focus on utilizing innovative 
tools and methods to deliver high quality calibration projects with maximum efficiency. He has over 12 years of experience in the transportation industry focused on calibration. With that, Talis, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the different industries that are um, currently needing calibration engineers. So the, the material so far has been somewhat uh, general, um, focusing on uh, primarily vehicles, though. Um, but there's a lot of industries outside of the passenger car industry that also require calibration engineers, and there are a lot of calibration engineers um, working in those areas. So the light duty passenger car area, and that's where um, Ford and Jim spend their time doing calibration work, is all the vehicles that uh, um, are less than 8,500 pounds gross vehicle weight, and there are some vehicles up to 14,000 pounds that are considered passenger cars. And so that's the, the bulk of what uh, um, the, the passenger car industry is looking at. Um, however, the heavy-duty on-highway industry, this is um, anything above 14,000 pounds, up to about 80,000 pounds, um, so has powertrains in them and, and requires calibration. And in some cases, the calibration effort required for something like that is um, maybe higher effort overall than it would be for a passenger car. Um, another area is non road or off-highway, um, so in these things that have engines and propulsion systems in them and require, um, in some cases, a significant amount of work. These are diesel engines, but they're not all diesel engines. Some are gasoline or um, other spark-ignited engines. Some have hybridization as well. Um, and these can range widely from uh, things like... Um, uh, bozers and gen sets, but all the way down to things like um, plate compactors that are used at construction sites. So, um, you know, handheld pieces of equipment as well. So, those things, um, if it if it has some type of an electronic control in it, it does require calibration. Areas um, that um, traditionally didn't require a lot of calibration effort. Um, but now are starting to our marine load of uh, large engines. So large engines are um, very big engines used for stationary power generation or like large mining operations um, and recreational vehicles like uh, snowmobiles and ATVs. So I'm going to get into a little bit of the, the different challenges that are faced by the different industries. Um, First is the, the light duty passenger car segment. Um, and the main challenges facing this industry are the um, increased full powertrain complexity. The uh, engines themselves are getting much more complicated than they were just a few years ago. Things like uh, direct injected, direct injected fuel systems, boosting systems like turbochargers, superchargers, variable cam timing. Um, diesel engines with after treatment, um, alternative fuels, handling capability. Um, so those are all things that are increasing the, the engine complexity. The transmissions, um, I don't know if people have been following the, uh, the press very much, but um, there is quite a bit of um, movement toward high numbers of gears and transmissions, so eight nine, ten speed transmissions. Um, every single one of those gear change events requires um, extensive calibration work to make those um, transitions from from one to another smooth and comfortable. And um, when you go from a five or six speed transmission to a nine or ten speed transmission, you have almost twice the amount of work to do. So dual clutch transmissions um, are making their way into the use and those require um, a different type of calibration. Um, some not mentioned on the slide are CVTs, um, 
and uh, automatic or automated manual transmissions as well. And then electrification affects both in and transmission calibration. So if you add any type of electrification, such as start, stop start systems or uh, plug in hybridization, hybrids, they, they all are uh, requiring calibration and it increases the complexity. Uh, overall, um, the efficiency of passenger cars needs to go up. Um, the, uh, the, the government is demanding it and the customers are also demanding it. Um, so in order to maximize the efficiency of, of vehicle, calibration is a key component of doing that. You can have great hardware, but unless the calibration is completely optimized, you're not going to get the best performance and the best efficiency. Um, the drivers are finding better refinement. High refinement is expected even in economy cars. So having, um, poor drivability is unacceptable for any market segment in passenger cars. Um, regulations that are coming up to affect the, uh, the passenger car industry is uh, mainly focused on reduction of um, emissions, either CO2 emissions, um, expecting to see around 34% fleet average reduction from 2016 to 25. That's going to require a lot of calibration effort to get there. Same for criteria pollutants, um, so NMOG and NOx. About 85% reduction from 2014 to 2025 is going to require a lot of calibration effort. And all has to function all the way out to 150,000 miles of full useful life. Um, so if it's not good enough to calibrate something to work well when it's out of the factory. It has to function all the way up to 150,000 miles and meet all those requirements. Um, car to X integration, uh, so that's car to car or car to infrastructure. Um, this is uh, it's going to become um, more common, but it's still, let's say, future technology where the the vehicle has to use things like GPS inputs, um, uh, traffic inputs to maximize the total energy management of the vehicle. Vehicle, looking at it at the uh, the you know the grade of the road to decide what the shift pattern should look like. Um, it won't be good enough to just come up with a shift pattern that's that's used in all environments anymore. So the vehicle needs to be calibrated to understand what the environment is around it and adapt itself. And calibration is going to be a, a huge portion of that. Moving to the, the heavy duty on highway, um, heavy duty on highway is um, something that we've calibration engineering um, in this segment for a long time. Um, however, there are some new requirements coming in that um, are for this industry um, quite a lot. The first one is on diagnostics. So, the passenger car industry has had onboard diagnostics for a long time. Uh, heavy duty has not required as um, significant on board diagnostics, but diagnostics that are equivalent to the, the passenger car industry are starting to affect the heavy industry in 2016. They'll be in full effect, so that's the end of their phase in period. So that's going to take a lot of work to get there. Um, in use or real world emissions need to be measured. Um, for the heavy duty guys, so it's good enough to take measurements in the lab and use those for uh, satisfying the, the regulators. They, you have to install a portable emissions measurement system in these vehicles and go out and do testing, and that's something that's fairly new for them. Um, that's where calibration is important because you have to make sure that you're meeting the, um, the emissions requirements in a lot more scenarios. The heavy industry is being affected by new uh, CO2 regulations by EPA and fuel economy standards by NHTSA. Uh, those are starting to phase in now. Um, the full useful life 
for some of the larger heavy duty vehicles is 435,000 miles. And I need to say that there's a typo in the, uh, the email that went out yesterday. Um, so the, the mileage number is incorrect. Uh, expectations on the, for the, uh, the 2 segment um, are because like passenger cars, um, fares are looking at um, driver stress and driver fatigue, and having a, a vehicle that is easy to drive and um, is smooth for a commercial vehicle is starting to become just as important as passenger vehicle. And then the the car two, in this case, it would be truck two X integration. Um, is something that is also affecting the, the heavy duty industry. Um, to the the non road or off highway industry, um, in this area, I would say they're seeing the biggest uh, the biggest change over the shortest period of time uh, as far as challenges. They're seeing right now a, um, a reduction in NOx in BM from 20 11 to 2015, that is going to be reduced by an order of magnitude. Um, it's a very short time to do that big of a reduction in NOx and PM emissions. Um, the uh, the technology step change, though, in order to achieve that, is, is basically we're, we're looking at um, an industry that was running with basically mechanically governed engines. Um, with no type of after treatment at all. Um, basically, the calibration was done with wrenches and screwdrivers. And um, they're looking at having to employ fully electronic controls with um, full after treatment systems, oxidation catalysts, SCR, and DPF in order to achieve their, um, their emissions targets. And so, say so that's, a, that's a big technology step change for this industry. Uh, that are um, that are difficult for the road industry is, is that these ends have to go into a very complex uh, machinery. So in this is one engine needs to go into um, you know dozens or or more different types of equipment and behave as well in each type of equipment. Um, so. The calibration in some cases is customized for the equipment, but in some cases the calibration must be robust to all different types of installation. So it's uh, it's a it's a it's a bill for that, that industry. And again, the full useful life is in, in some some of the heavier power classes for um, off road requires 8,000 hours of full useful life durability. So it needs to meet the emissions requirements and behave the same on 8,000 as it did in one. Big challenge for calibration robustness. Uh, these, um, are the locomotive large engine and recreational vehicle. Um, the marine industry is looking at new standards um, in from 2014 to 2017 that will require additional after treatment if they are diesels. Um, the locomotive industry is also looking at new standards that they're expecting to require diesel after treatment, which is also going to require calibration. And then the use of CNG and um, LNG. Um, and either dedicated fuel or, in, in cases, biofuel applications is something that's expected in this industry as well. So, common threads, though, for all the industries is that the need for calibration en engineers is driven primarily by the legislation. So, the rulemaking done by EPA. Environmental Protection Agency, CARB, the California Air Resources Board, um, NHTSA, um, other agencies on air quality, safety, reducing energy use, greenhouse gas emissions, 
regulations, really anything to do with uh, the welfare of the public um, is driving a lot of this. Um, as mentioned several times, higher system complexity and new technology, um, increased number of vehicle and engine variants, and um, demands for shorter time to market is mainly driven by rapid changes in technology. Customers want the newest technology in their vehicles. Um, as soon as possible. So, looking down a little bit more specifically, though, um, the need for more calibration engineers is different depending on the type of technology involved. Um, this is a chart that was put together, um, and let's say it's definitely um, something that's open for discussion and argument. Uh, but but with the, in if the the diesel propulsion source is involved, the primary uh, demand is driven by emissions, diagnostics, and drivability. Um, on the gasoline side, we'd say that the, the the drivers for needing additional calibration engineers is driven by fuel economy requirements and new technology going into the engines. Um, on the transmission side, the demand for new calibration engineers is, is um, driven by improving drivability, um, improving fuel economy, and in increased complexity of the transmissions. As I mentioned, the multiple gears um, come in. Um, the uh, hybrid or EV type vehicles, um, diagnostics is, is a big challenge for those um, because it's such a new technology. Fuel economy um, is is one of the main reasons why you um, would want to hybridize and and new technologies as well. Um, maybe the 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 need for calibration engineers is a global need. Um, so we're talking from a U.S. perspective, but recognizing that throughout the world there's a need for calibration engineers. Um, what we've seen is that the highest need for skilled calibration engineers is, is in um, emerging automotive markets. So China, India, South America, to name a few. The second highest need actually is in the U.S. Um, the calibration engineering um, is thing that is not specifically taught as a university um, curriculum career path. And so a lot of people come out of university not being even aware that calibration engineering is a career choice for them. Europe, Japan, and Korea also have a need for calibration engineers, but to, I would say to a slightly lesser extent than the other areas of the world. Um, so being said, um, what this advisory committee is doing with SAE is um, we're we're putting together this introductory course, of course, to inform people about what calibration engineering is. We're also developing a core map that's a combination of existing SAE seminars, webinars, uh, training courses um, to give people a direction as to how they can accelerate their path into the field of calibration engineering. Um, this committee will be working to uh, put together additional course material that will fill in the gaps um, between the existing SAE course material. Um, so there will be some specific calibration-related courses um, coming soon. Uh, and basically, this is just the start of what we're doing. Our goal is to try to get more calibration engineers into the field. Um, we think it's a, a good thing for everybody, and, and, and frankly, I think it's probably one of the most exciting areas of the automotive field, and we'd like to get more people involved in it. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Sam.
Thanks, Collis. Well, it's time now to open up our phone lines for your comments, questions, and experiences relating to, today, to today's topic. And it's easy for you to let us know you'd like in on the conversation. On the right side of your screen, and we're going to go back to Training Center view, um, make sure you have the participant list open because in the lower left of that window is a little icon that looks like a raised hand. And clicking on that raised hand will place an icon next to your name on the participant list. When we see your raised hand, we'll unmute your phone line in order that it was raised and invite you to speak to us. And if you're joining us by voice over IP uh, and you don't have a microphone on your headset, you may want to submit your question through the Q&A box, and I'll try to read it to you, uh, on your behalf. But we do want to get people in on the phone line here shortly. I'm going to kick things off first with a question to Bill. Um, Bill, if I'm a college student, what would I do at the university to start to prepare for a career in calibration engineering? Yeah, uh, one of the, the things to do is, is is get some good basic understanding of the area you're interested. So, say you're you want to be an engine calibrator. Vehicle. Um, to understand, take some engine combustion classes. Some of the best calibrators are the guys that really understand, you know, their system they're working on, and and those are usually taught at the universities. Um, I think the other thing that really helps out we got into a little bit was some of the, um, the skills, the the computer skills that go on that go on that uh, help you analyze the data. That um, you know that the lab skills can really be good. Uh, as a calibration engineer that uh, usually are taught at universities as well. Okay, anybody want to add anything to that? I'd like to add to that that, that um, when you're in university, there's a lot of options for, um, for student design projects. Uh, some of the student design projects that we found produce some really great calibration engineers are um, uh, full SAE, uh, that was the things that I did in university. And if uh, Formula C has an electronic controlled engine, which all of them do now, that electronic controlled engine requires calibration. Um, the other ones are EcoCar. Any um, of the student nine competitions, um, if you're into the calibration field, there are opportunities there to do that. Okay, thanks, Tallis. I'm going to go ahead and call on our friend Rob. Let's unmute, unmute Rob's phone line. Rob, go ahead. Hi. Um, my question was, for Julian, how uh, passionate um, entry level recent grad am up to be a calibration engineer? Good question, Rob. How an entry level uh, student enter into the calibration engineering field? The first thing you would want to do <clears throat> is to search, um, do a search on the internet for postings uh, with keywords like calibration, calibration specialist. And, uh, there are a whole host of jobs available. From entry level perspective, you, you may want to start off in a, in a dynamometer environment, especially on the engine side, to to really hone your skills so you're able to be ready for calibration task. In addition, um, both of the major OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, General Motors, Ford, Toyota, and others, they have programs in their uh, hiring plans that, that really facilitate themselves to uh, grooming person interested in the field to, to become calibration engineers. And then you go on an interview or you, you get an opportunity to to start a job with one of these companies, you definitely want to ask about career planning to really embrace the calibration field. Thank you. Um, we're going to go ahead and invite Varun to uh, go ahead and ask a question. Varun, your phone line's open. Varun, there? Hello? Hi, go ahead. Hi. Uh, this question is to all the panelists. Um, I wanted to know what kind of tools can a simulation engineer 
develop for a successful career in calibration? And are there benefits of having any simulation experience, like the power? I answer that if it's okay. I would say that uh, there are a lot of uh, benefits to having experience in the areas of simulation. Um, one of the things that calibration engineers spend a lot of their time doing is developing models of systems um, within our train or within the vehicle um, and developing models of those systems to use as the control um, is a very valuable skill. Um, there's a, a big movement with the industry now to do more calibration work in a simulation environment rather than on a real vehicle or on a real engine on a dyno um, and interfacing uh, the controls with a virtual a powertrain, a virtual engine, a virtual transmission, something that's, um, I would say, the future of calibration. So to answer your question, yes, a simulation engineer does have a role in calibration. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and move on to a question that we have in the Q&A box from Rohit. He's asking, what do you think with regards to calibration work? the world harmonized driving cycle comes into effect. Um, comment on that? Well, from what I've seen um, on, on the driving cycle throughout, throughout the world, um, the way the regulatory systems are set up right now, the different countries have unique drive cycles, but customers drive the vehicles pretty much in the same fashion around the way. So the calibration engineer really needs to understand where his vehicles go in, those, in, in all the markets. And, and with the, the way all the OEMs are, are becoming global, um, they, they pretty much attack that as a global method right now. The focus that, that Ford just released was a global product, and it had to meet all the different requirements for North America, Europe, China, South America. Um, they have different drive, official drive cycles, but from a, uh, a calibration standpoint, um, it was developed as a global global product. So when a global drive cycle would come in, uh, I think that the task is still going to be similar because that's what the task that the future plan that we're going down now is that you need to be mobile to be competitive in this market. Hey, thank you. Let's move on to back to our phone lines and ask Ravi. Uh, we've unmuted your line. Go ahead. Uh, hi, hi to all. First of all, thank you, Julian, for that Venn diagram. That really helps a lot. I have a question for Bill. Uh, can you tell me something about the vehicle interface tools that you mentioned, the EPAS and ACI or, or other tools? And the question would be for TALS. Can you uh, give me some uh, some? Can you light on the term that you use, top shelf refinement, in the even for economy cars? I didn't understand that even for economy cars part. Thank you. Okay, so you're questioning the the, the specific tools that, that the calibrator uses. Um, uh, um, OE or 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 uh, corporation that that. Uh, has certain tools, and, and some of them are, are pretty generic tools, um, ETOS and AI, and, and these are tools that you use to interface with the modules in the car, um, specifically the, the powertrain control module. It allows you to go in and monitor all the um, parameters that are getting updated, um, the sensors, control the actuators, and make it on the fly to improve the system. Um, so really, to get, get these knowledge of these skills, it, it, it's, it's basically having a good computer understanding how how software works. Um, there's a, there's a few basic ones that are used in the industry, but other people might ha have their own in-house systems. 
Um, once you learn one, the uh, they pretty much transfer from one to the other. Um, you know, a little learning curve involved if you switch from an ATI to uh, to an ETOS type system, but the the basic operations or fundamentals of them are, are similar between the two. I think we have time to entertain one more question. Um, well, let's. I've, Okay. There was a there was a second part to his question. Oh, he was I'm asking sorry. about yeah. um, what I meant by top shelf refinement in economy cars. Mm -hmm. um, even, I mean, top shelf refinement just means that um, everybody is expecting their car to be flawless as far as drivability. Um, so even on a very uh, cheap car, or say an entry level car. Um, there's no room for um, for issues regarding drivability. So the, the there is that, that you need to put an equal amount of effort into all products to produce something that has um, high levels of refinement. The customer expectations now are that any car, uh, whether it's the, the cheapest car in the fleet or the most expensive car in the fleet, um, pays nearly perfectly. Okay, with an economy car, I took it as fuel efficient car. My bad. Oh, I mean, so economy car, I, I meant that as being an um, inexpensive vehicle. Okay, thank you. And we'll take one more question. Let's go ahead and open up the phone line for Justin. Uh, Justin F. Uh, Justin, go ahead. Oh, I'm an engineering student. This question is for all the panelists. As an engineering student, other than taking courses related to calibration and also participating in the university design project, how can the real world experience as a corporation that I could potentially work for after graduation? Do you have any advice for Justin? I can take that one, Sam. So, for real world, um, expertise or experience within the calibration area, um, you find blogs online that, that have information with regards to vehicle performance tuning or vehicle dynamics. Um, in addition, there are racetracks that people take personal cars to that, that they do their own tuning of their vehicles. There, there are a number of forums that you can go to and, and get this type of information. But for the most part, the complexity is, is, is growing and the ability to, to tap into the actual control modules is, is becoming a lot more stringent. Um, and so as we go forward into the future, there's definitely going to be more challenges within uh, tuning vehicles or tuning calibrations outside of the, the spectrum realm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to have to close out the Q&A segment of our program. However, for those of you who still have your hands raised or have entered questions into the Q&A, I would uh, ask you to continue to enter your questions into that Q&A box. We'll compile them and send them on to our speakers and try and get back to everyone, everyone of, in our audience, with some narrative responses to those questions. So we'll leave that Q&A box open a little bit after we close things out. I did want to take this opportunity to thank each of our presenters, Bill Sheeran with Ford Motor Company, Julian Blair with General Motors, and Tallis Park of AL. On behalf of SAE and the Calibration Engineering Industry Advisory Team, I'm Sam Meinhardt, and we hope that this presentation has increased your insight into calibration engineering.